The cover for Fifty Shades Darker features the Venetian mask that Anna wears to the Grey's Masquerade Ball in Chapter 6. You'd assume that masks are thematically relevant to the rest of the book, like Fifty Shades Darker is about the masks we wear, the idea of persona, and the exaggerated or false versions of ourselves that we create for different environments and scenarios. Congratulations, you just put more thought into metaphor than the author. Fifty Shades Darker is a 2017 film directed by James Foley, written by Neil Leonard based off the 2011 novel of the same name, written by television executive Erica Mitchell under the pen name E.L. James. While the previous film put a lot of effort into trying to elevate the source material into a dark romance drama, Fifty Shades Darker gets trapped in the whirlpool of its source material and drowns. The key bit to remember from the full history of Fifty Shades is that Darker was originally the second half of a singular fanfiction titled Master of the Universe, encompassing chapters 53 through 87 of that fic, originally published online in serial format from late 2009 through early 2010. The other point to remember is that even though creative leads had contracts securing them for the entire trilogy, the second and third films weren't technically greenlit when the first film was in production. In the weeks leading up to the release of Fifty Shades of Grey, Universal announced their plans for Fifty Shades Darker and Fifty Shades Freed. The two films would be shot back to back in 2016, with Darker releasing early 2017 and Freed in early 2018. Then, a month after the release of Fifty Shades, in March of 2015, it was announced that director Sam Taylor Johnson and screenwriter Kelly Marcel would not be returning for the subsequent films, both citing conflicts with Mitchell as part of the reason for their departure. The two women would subsequently be replaced by Work for Hire director James Foley, best known for a dozen episodes of House of Cards, the 1992 adaptation of Glengarry Glen Ross, and several Madonna music videos from the 80s, and television writer Neil Leonard, best known for being married to Erica Mitchell. Like so many of the films that I talk about here, Fifty Shades Darker is a movie that largely defies your ability to keep it all in order. There isn't a strong plot or a clear sense of escalation or even a coherent sort of episodic series of events, so it's easy to get all just a bit jumbled. So for review, the plot of Fifty Shades Darker goes like this. Oh, and for comedy purposes, keep in mind that the following events all happen in the span of 11 days. For a prologue, Christian has a bad dream about his bad, dark, grim, dark, dark, sad childhood. I'm not trying to make light of abuse, it's just that this entire thread is handled with about as much delicacy as the death of Batman's parents. Anyway, credits. Anna is sad because of breakup, the title montage calls attention to Leela, the woman that is stalking Anna, done in a way that is filmically appropriate, but comical once you realize how little she will matter to the film as a whole. The other focal point is Anna's new job as the assistant to fiction editor Jack Hyde. Anna goes to her friend Jose's art exhibit, which consists mostly of giant copies of Dakota Johnson's actor headshots. Christian, looking distinctly purple, shows up and buys all the photos. Anna ditches Jose to instead have dinner with Christian. He tells her that he wants to try again, and this time... You wanna... what do you call it? A vanilla relationship? I mean, we only do what you're comfortable with. Well, let's put a pin in that. Anna goes to work. Jack invites her out for drinks. The head of human resources makes a face that tells the audience that this is a bad idea because she clearly knows something about Jack Hyde that's a red flag above and beyond his name being Jack Hyde. Anna has an encounter with Leela in the street where we are shown the bloody bandages on her wrist letting us know that she's a crazy person in a movie. Anna doesn't even touch her beer and manages about three quarters of a sentence worth of conversation with Jack before Christian shows up and they immediately leave to get groceries and product placement. Your new favorite flavor. <laughs> they cook dinner while Jamie Dornan tries really, really, really hard to look like he doesn't know how to use a kitchen knife. As Christian and Anna are talking, she pieces together that Christian is buying the company she works for, they argue, they have sex, they pillow talk, and Leela breaks in and watches them sleep. Anna tries to give back the $24,000 Christian got from selling Anna's old beat-up blue Volkswagen, and then Christian has one of his people deposit the money directly into her bank account. Christian, how do you have my bank information? They have an argument about Leela over breakfast. Christian invites Anna to his parents' charity ball. He takes her to Elena's salon. Why would you take me to meet the woman who seduced and abused you? They fight in the street about it because, I mean, really? 
Back at home, Christian fills in the backstory on Leela. She wanted more. I didn't. So I ended it. When you and I were in Georgia together, she turned up here and tried to slit her wrists in front of Mrs. Jones, my housekeeper. Put a pin in that one, too. In the course of this conversation, he reveals he has a stalker folder for all of his ex-subs and prospective subs. Anna demands to see hers and is rightfully upset. Sex is not gonna fix this right now. Are you insane? Anna. But Christian placates her by letting her draw a map of his no-go zone with lipstick, and the dossier is never mentioned again. They get ready for the ball, which includes Anna wearing a set of Benoit balls, also known as Kegel balls. They go to the charity ball, where Anna gets super turned on by the Kegel balls, and can I just say that I hate this shot so much? It's not strictly a bad shot, but I've seen it so many times at this point that I can't help but notice how overly posed and unnatural it is with Christian being at a perfect 90 degree angle to Anna who's staring straight at the camera and how it doesn't actually flow with the preceding shot because of the way that the eye line changes. Well, maybe that's just me. During the auction, Anna spends the $24,000 on a weekend at Christian's cabin. They have sex in Christian's childhood bedroom. A mysterious figure is lurking on the stairs, taking photos of Christian's family. It's important, but it'll never make sense. Elena confronts Anna in the hallway and is just vaguely menacing. Do you think you're the first woman he'd hoped would save him? We'll put a big pin in this conversation because this is when we start to really get into the whole BDSM is damaged subtext rising to the level of pure text. When they get home after the party, Anna's car is destroyed, presumably by Leela. Put a pin in it. Anna and Christian spend the night and the next day on his boat. On Monday at work, Jack is suddenly an asshole. There's a whole tiff over Anna going to New York with him for Book Expo, which turns into a tiff with Christian about Book Expo. Put a pin in it. Anna shows up at Christian's place, and there's a lengthy introduction to Mrs. Jones. Put a pin in it. Christian comes home, and the two of them bone. There's more of the weird non-argument argument about Book Expo, where Christian is hung up on Anna going to New York without him. Put a second pin in it. At the end of work the next day, Jack attacks Anna, and Christian sends Taylor in to beat up Jack. Christian gets Jack fired and convinces Anna to move in. The next day at work, keeping in mind that this is now the middle of Anna's second week at the job, Anna is asked to fill in for Jack at an editor's meeting where all the olds are like, we should sell less books. And she wows everyone with her wisdom by saying, actually, I think we should sell more books which earns her a temporary promotion from assistant to acting fiction editor after eight days with the company. The fact that her boyfriend just bought the company totally has nothing to do with it, I swear. There's a bunch of sex. At work, Anna is talking with Jack's other assistant, Hannah, who is now her assistant, and we get the movie's philosophical statement on the ideal nature of power. I mean, am, am I expected to call you Miss Steele? I expect you to call me Anna. And I don't expect you to fetch me coffee unless you're getting some for yourself. And the rest of it will just make up as we go. After work, Anna goes to her apartment to get some things, and Leela confronts her with a gun. Christian walks in and uses his super dom hypno powers on Leela, and Anna runs away and wanders the street for a couple hours. Leela will never be seen again, and there's still 40 minutes of the movie left to cover. When she gets home, she has a fight with Christian where Jamie Dornan really struggles to keep his American accent up with all the hard N sounds. She had a gun, Anna. And we get the big moment you've all been waiting for. I'm a sadist. I like to whip little brown-haired girls like you because you all look like the crack whore, my birth mother. Dominate. I'm not a dominant. I'm not. I... The right term is a sadist. I get off on punishing women, women who look like you. Like your look... mother. Oh, well, that's disappointing. Put a pin in it. Anyway, he lets her touch his chest, which means he's fixed now and doesn't need BDSM. That night, he proposes in his sleep, then again the next morning, and then Anna finds out it's Christian's birthday on Saturday, so she gets him a gift, and now he needs to go to Portland for work, but he'll be back Friday night, so Anna goes drinking with friends, and Christian's helicopter crashes, but it's cool. He's fine. He walks in, no big deal. What the hell are y'all doing here? 
Anna tells him to open the gift because it's past midnight, so it's his birthday, and it's a keychain that says yes, so they have a bunch of sex. At Christian's birthday party, there's a waiter with hors d'oeuvres who gets all moon-eyed at Christian, put a pin in it, then Christian announces their engagement, which elicits a sinister close-up from Jose, who is inexplicably at this party, even though in the extended edition he explicitly says he's not going to be there because it would be weird. Will we be seeing you tomorrow at his party? Don't push it. <laughs> there's another confrontation with Elena that includes a baffling jump cut. That right there? I didn't cut that. It really just straight up cuts between two nearly identical close-ups that are only offset by a slight angle. This movie was in theaters. Back in Christian's childhood room, Anna and Christian have a conversation about Christian's birth mom, and there's a Chronicles of Riddick poster on the wall behind his door, which as a background storytelling element is far more interesting than anything in the actual conversation. Then they go out to the boathouse, Christian re-re-re-proposes, this time with a ring, and there's fireworks and everyone is happy except Jack Hyde, who's looking on from the other side of the lake, being all sinister, and he's got a printout of the photo that he took of the photo in the house, so now that we know that the sinister person during the ball was in fact Jack Hyde. Anyway, that's what happens in this movie. Are you tired of subscription loot boxes that send you metaphorical garbage every month? Introducing Garbox, the only subscription loot box focused exclusively on literal, actual garbage. The theme this month and every month is fast food paper waste. Go to d.rip slash foldable human and enter the offer code SENDMEGARBAGE to start receiving Garbox today. Most of the nice things that there are to say about the movie are largely carried over from the previous film, to the point that I could pretty much copy-paste those details here. The removal of Anna's internal monologue both improves the story and her character. Christian is still a manipulative stalker, but he's less of a terrifying rage monster. The through line where Christian endlessly needles Anna over her eating habits has been dropped entirely, and ditto the endless needling over birth control, so on, so forth. For book-specific changes, it's suggested that Anna gets her temporary promotion from assistant to fiction editor in the middle of her second week at the job because she impresses the weirdo editor-in-chief, which, I mean, it's an improvement over the book where Christian pretty blatantly pulls strings to make sure she gets promoted and then mocks her for it. Don't tell them. He says. Don't tell them what? That I own it. The heads of agreement was signed yesterday. The news is embargoed for four weeks while the management at SIP makes some changes. Oh, will I be out of a job? I ask, alarmed. I sincerely doubt it. Christian says wryly, trying to stifle his smile. The management here gave you Hyde's job to babysit. They didn't want the expense of hiring a senior executive when the company was mid-sale. They had no idea what the new owner would do with it once it passed into his ownership, and... Wisely, they didn't want an expensive redundancy. So, they gave you Hyde's job to caretake until the new owner. He pauses and his lips twitch in an ironic smile. Namely, me, took over. A lot of boring logistical stuff has been dropped. The movie takes advantage of the break between films to conveniently forget that half of Anna's life is in Portland and half is in Seattle, so we don't need to deal with her trying to get down to Portland for Jose's show, or Jose being stranded in Seattle during Christian's helicopter mishap, forcing him to sleep in the bedroom Christian keeps for his subs, listening to the two of them bang in the room above all night. Yes, literally all of that is in the book in excruciating detail. He switches the water on to Max. Jeez! Arctic water spurts over my backside, and I squeal, then stop, mindful once more that Jose is above us. The break between the movies also implies a less concrete span of time between the two films. There's still definitely the impression that it's recent, and based on events that have stated temporal relationships like Jose's exhibit, the overall timeline hasn't really been changed at all, but it's better to not call attention to it, because it kind of sucks all the drama and significance out of the end of the previous movie once you say it out loud that the two of them remain broken up for less than four full days. Still, saying that the movie has at least managed to rise above the source material is, in this case, damning with faint praise. The filmmakers don't exactly deserve Oscars for having the good sense to drop the scene where Anna is blown away that Christian has given her an iPod with 12 songs on it. This book takes place in 2011. 
From the perspective of design, tone, and the overall nature of the adaptation, Darker is still decidedly contiguous with the first film, and this is probably the most interesting thing about it. Despite the change in creative leads and Erica Mitchell consolidating creative power, the second and third film are still built on the foundation laid by the previous writer and director. Most notably, Anna and Christian still behave like their film versions instead of their book versions. Now, I can't speak definitively as to why, but I have an educated guess, and it comes down to studio interference and the nature of the new hires. The first film had performed incredibly well at the box office, but there's still the limited shelf life for these kinds of cultural phenomenon, and even by 2015, it was obvious that Fifty Shades' moment of cultural relevance had peaked and was now on the downslope. This is why Universal opted to film the two movies back-to-back -back on a reduced budget per film. James Foley's hiring wasn't official until November 2015, with the film scheduled to go to camera in February of 2016. With such an extremely limited time frame and an already successful film, there was probably a mandate from Universal that boiled down to no more big changes. The other thing that's significant is that Neil Leonard and James Foley both have the majority of their experience working in television. In fact, this is probably why James Foley was hired in the first place. As a television director, he's used to coming into a situation with limited personal pre-production, where he's directing episodes 6, 8, and 13 of a series that's been running for two seasons already, where production designers and the camera department essentially work independent of him. You know, he shows up on set and costume department comes to him and is like, okay, here's the stuff that this character wears, which one do you want for this scene? Television directors and writers tend to put a lot of power into the hands of actors because the actors are the constant in the scenario. So with a probable mandate from Universal to just get things done, stay on schedule, and not rock the boat, I would assume that Foley, in turn, would basically defer to Dakota Johnson and Jamie Dornan on set whenever it came to questions about how their characters would behave, their phrasing, tone of voice, reactions, and general interplay. That said... You can still totally tell that Sam Taylor Johnson and Kelly Marcel were replaced by men. There's a character to the framing and blocking of scenes, most notable in the sex. Out of darker sex scenes, Christian only takes off his pants once, and there's a distinct discomfort with framing Christian's nudity in an overtly sexual manner meant for consumption, landing instead on self-depictions of masculinity that hetero men are more comfortable with. Where the first film included shots like this, where the focus of the shot is on Christian's sexual form, his movement and poise in an overtly sexual scenario, the closest equivalent shot in Darker is when Anna watches Christian work out. It may feel slight, the difference between a shot that says, this man is coming to f*** you, and one that says, look at this dude getting buff, but it's an aesthetic sensibility that pervades the visual language of the film. So let's start talking about that adaptation. Fifty Shades Darker is a nightmare of a book to try and adapt. As the second half of a huge directionless serial fanfiction, it, more than any other part of the series, suffers from all the maladies that serial fiction tends to attract. The overall plot is unfocused and spread sparsely throughout the book, the vast majority of the page count is dedicated to repetitive arguments and squabbles that neither advance the plot or develop the characters, and the nearest thing to a central plot resolves a little more than halfway through the book, with the remainder of the volume stuffed to bursting with more arguments and a series of dead-end episodes that are telltale of a zombie fic one that is narratively resolved, but continues to update weekly propelled only by the author's own creative inertia and ego. The movie adapts maybe 50% of the book, and huge chunks of the first half are just outright discarded. Like, to give you an idea of what was dropped, after Anna's car is trashed, they spend several hours lingering at a scala while phone calls are made, there's an argument about Leela and an argument about Elena, before they move to a hotel, a process that includes a beat-by-beat -beat navigation of who is staying in which room, as though it's going to be critically important for the reader to have a sense of the geography of the hotel and how far away their bodyguards are, but then... nothing happens. All they do is have sex, sleep, and Christian's on-call gynecologist comes over to the hotel and guilt trips Anna for forgetting to take her pill and then gives her a pregnancy test and hormone injection. 
Then they buy Anna a new car, which Christian refuses to let her drive. Oh, and also, Earlier, she found out that Christian buys all his subs the same car, and so this is important because Christian is now buying her a car that's different from the car that all these other subs got, and I know it feels like I'm spending a lot of time belaboring this point, and now imagine just how thrilling it must be to actually read this because it gets a lot of pages. The longest chapter in the book is an extension of the argument about New York that involves Anna getting an email from Elena and then sending an angry email to Christian, to which Christian gets upset because she sent an explicit email over the company's servers. So off page, Christian has his people call SIP's IT people to have the email deleted off the servers. And then Jack comes back into the scene and just tells Anna that the situation has changed and management says she's not allowed to go to New York after all. And Anna goes to a Scala and then Elena shows up and they argue, then Elena leaves and Anna fights with Christian about Elena and then they fight about Anna not being allowed to drive her new car. And there's a whole subplot where Kate's brother Ethan, not to be confused with Kate's boyfriend Elliot, is staying over for a few days so Anna needs to get him the spare keys to her apartment but Christian doesn't want her to leave the office and gets mad at her because she walked to the deli to get lunch and so she needs to get explicit permission from Christian to walk out to the curb to hand Ethan the house keys and all of that that takes multiple emails to negotiate. Chapter 17 consists largely of Christian allowing Anna to drive her new car for the first time, an event through which he treats her like a tween being allowed to pull down the driveway for the first time and not, you know, an adult who's been driving for years and is comfortable making the three hour drive from Portland to Seattle and back. Like, he won't let her turn on the radio because music would be too distracting. Can we have the radio on? I ask as we wait at the first stop sign. I want you to concentrate. He says sharply. Christian, please. I can drive with music on. I roll my eyes. He scowls for a minute, then reaches for the radio. You can play your iPod and MP3 disc as well as CDs on this. He murmurs. Also, that exchange implies he's compromising by letting her listen to her personal collection of music, but not the radio. I mean, I get that this is supposed to be Christian obsessing over Anna's safety, like reviewing the actuarial tables for the Saab 9.3 convertible option after Anna says maybe she'd like to get a convertible is just an extension of hiring more security guards after Leela gets a gun permit, but it's also kinda... dumb. And yes, that does happen. Christian frowns and peers at me. Convertible? He asks, raising an eyebrow. I flush. It's like he has a direct hotline to my inner goddess, which, of course, he has. It's most inconvenient at times. I stare down at my hands. Christian turns to Troy. What are the safety stats on the convertible? Troy, sensing Christian's vulnerability, heads in for the kill, reeling off all manner of statistics. It's not cute. There's no tension and it's not relevant. There's no moment where it builds to any meaningful conflict or payoff. It's clearly supposed to be an extension of Christian's damage. You're saying 50 shades of fucked up. But how does any of his trauma connect to obsessing over safety? It doesn't. So in the internal logic, this is just a personality trait that the character developed all on his own. It's not motivated by anything in particular. It's not an expression or extension of the core conflict the character needs to deal with. It's just one more entirely distinct personality flaw in a laundry list of distinct, unrelated personality flaws. Oh, and the other half of chapter 17 is Anna talking to Christian's therapist for 15 pages, a conversation that basically amounts to, hey, did you know BDSM isn't a mental illness? And also, you're totally fixing him. Dr. Flynn sighs. Anna, in the very limited time that you've known him, you've made more progress with my patient than I have in the last two years. You've had a profound effect on him. You must see that. They have been dating for three and a half weeks. By page count, these kinds of meaningless, circular, repetitive arguments are the actual nature of Fifty Shades Darker because this kind of structureless mass is the stuff that Master of the Universe is made of. Now, it's really easy to talk about serialized literature as a kind of de facto negative, like serialization is going to yield garbage by default, and it takes an exceptional storyteller to elevate it beyond the baseline, but that's not true. 
While there are a lot of tells that serial fiction tends to leave behind when approached in a compiled or completed form, usually it just adds to the flavor and texture of the work. It lends itself to being less tightly or rigidly structured, but serial isn't synonymous with structureless and unfocused. The ability to stay focused, to understand your characters and themes, to have a compelling plot or scenario or world or whatever the hook is for your story, these are just basic storytelling skills. Also, I feel like it's worth pointing out that Master of the Universe and Fifty Shades by Inheritance isn't even really episodic. Now, despite their close relationship, episodic fiction and serial fiction aren't synonymous. To Kill a Mockingbird is episodic, but not serial, while many webcomics like Questionable Content are serial, but storylines are too long and flowing to really be considered episodic. And just as a sidebar, I enjoy Questionable Content. I think it's charming slice-of-life drama, but it would make an awful movie if you tried to adapt it as is instead of taking the characters and premise and writing a screenplay from scratch. Just saying. The hallmark of episodic fiction is in the name, well-defined episodes with each episode following an identifiable plot structure as a micro version of the work as a whole. The Enterprise has arrived at a place where something is happening, things go wrong, then they get worse, then someone comes up with a solution, and the credits roll. This structure, or indeed any structure, is entirely absent in Master of the Universe. Chapters swing wildly from 5 to 21 pages, and these chapters were then compressed together during the conversion to novel, which is where you get weirdness like Fifty Shades Darker Chapter 11, where, in the course of a single chapter, the trip to New York for Book Expo is both introduced and cancelled. This is why the culminating moment of the first book, Anna breaking up with Christian, is completely undone within the first 30 pages of the second book. In turn, this is why the start of the movie is so jumbled and haphazard, and it's why the movie effectively ends here with Christian's big moment, but keeps going for another 45 minutes afterwards. Darker isn't really the start of a second major arc, it's just the ongoing stream of consciousness, compulsive writing of someone more concerned with maintaining their online status, their presence and dominance in a community, than they are with the actual story that they're telling. Once you approach Master of the Universe and its derivatives as, first and foremost, serial fiction as public performance, it all snaps into sharp focus. Suddenly you understand why there's a helicopter crash that is effortlessly resolved a few minutes later when Christian just walks in the door, why the principal antagonist of the film, the stalker that was given a tremendous amount of visual weight during the introduction, is dealt with off-screen at the midpoint of the film and never seen again. The movie tries, though. Half-heartedly, but it tries. They flip the conflict with Jack and the conflict with Leela in order to try and create some element of escalation, since, you know, gun. But that's about as extreme as it gets with adaptational changes. There's still almost half the movie hanging off the back end of the climax. And Master of the Universe really is the original sin here. Since that manuscript was never edited, was never properly condensed and reworked into a focused story with plot threads weaving in between each other, everything still arrives in a very serial order. While huge chunks of the book can be discarded because they're just meaningless arguments, the plot itself is a very rigid sort of chaos. It's an illusory transitive sequence, like ABC, BCD, CDE, DEF, EFG. Chapter 4 has nothing to do with Chapter 1, but you can't remove it without making Chapter 5 incomprehensible. There's just enough overlap between each one that it's almost impossible to change anything structural without getting completely radical. You can't just drop the back half of the movie because that's where the entire proposal story happens, which can't just be turfed because it's the foundation of the third movie, which is being shot back to back with this one, and you can't weave that into the rest of the movie because that entire storyline is contingent on Christian's big emotional breakthrough moment, and that moment can't be pushed earlier because it's the culmination of a conflict with Leela, which is actually sort of the plot of the stuff preceding it, so you can't just push that earlier because then you just have the opposite problem where there's a weird stalker plot taking up the first half hour of the movie. 
And this isn't even touching on the Jack stuff, which is almost entirely superfluous to the story of Darker, but can't be cut because it's the core plot of the next movie. Baby, it's gonna take more than a malfunctioning 135 to keep me away from you. 135? Charlie Tango. She's a Eurocopter EC-135. The safest in its class. <sighs> All right, let's work through these pins. First up. You wanna, what do you call it? A vanilla relationship? I mean, we only do what you're comfortable with. So vanilla as a relationship term doesn't really have a set meaning. Like people who are really into BDSM and kink consider the stuff that Christian and Anna do to be pretty vanilla. This is basically the joke that I used to open the previous video in this series. YouTube law states that you can't do a video about Fifty Shades of Grey without wearing fuzzy pink handcuffs or some other non-threatening bachelorette party level signifier of kink that inadvertently captures the dissonance between intensity of the marketing around Fifty Shades of Grey as some really taboo pushing kink and the actual product. But to a lot of people, the stuff that they do goes way out of the realm of vanilla. Like wearing a hidden sex toy to a very public high society event that's actually kind of hardcore. But we're not here to litigate the precise definition of vanilla. I just want to address it to contrast what Christian actually says. I mean, we only do what you're comfortable with. Mm, yeah, it's super gross that the movie expects us to think Christian is being totally magnanimous by agreeing to respect her limits. This actually becomes another indicator of the changing creative teams. While Darker's Anna still behaves and holds herself more or less the same, on a deep level, the movie just doesn't understand Anna or care about what she might want or think about something. Anna is simultaneously supposed to be super weirded out by all the kinky stuff and her own relationship to it, but she's also down for just about anything. The previous two times that Anna was spanked by Christian, it triggered a lot of intense emotions, but here she just goes with it, asks for it, because the authors think it's hot. The whole point of their breakup, which Anna says out loud, is that she doesn't feel like she can trust him because he gets off on hurting her. I want you back. But I don't see how you are getting off on the pain you inflicted. So with that as the context, a scene like the one where Christian brings out the Benoit balls becomes suspect. Christian doesn't explain what they are. He doesn't try to build trust or confirm that she's comfortable with the idea. He takes her comfort as implied because the authors already know she's going to be okay with it because they're making the damn thing. This trust me it's a surprise you'll like it dynamic isn't bad or unhealthy on its own, but it's explicitly the opposite of the dynamic the other half of the movie says these characters have. This is a running motif throughout the film where the authors use non-communication as the setup for sex play. Anna and Christian have an exchange about the spreader bar that's comical for a number of reasons. What's this? Let's learn to walk before we run. First, it hits this point of non-communication, where Christian just refuses to actually explain anything. Second, he's already had Anna tied up Spread Eagle to his sex bed in his sex dungeon. In their own analogy, a spreader bar is maybe a light jog. All right, next pin. When you and I were in Georgia together, she turned up here and tried to slit her wrist in front of Mrs. Jones, my housekeeper. This is a hilarious bit of backfill since it amounts to, here's a super important thing that happened just off camera left during the last movie, but we never mentioned it. And this is exactly how it's done in the books too. Now, I don't blame Kelly Marcel for not mentioning it during Fifty Shades of Grey. It's completely irrelevant to the story of the book that she was adapting, but it's equally telling that Neil Leonard didn't think of a better way to do it. Like, I don't know, what if they're at Christian's place instead of Anna's, and this intensely boring sex scene was replaced with a dark action scene where their kissing is interrupted by Leela walking in, and she grabs the knife that Christian was using, and the three of them have a confrontation that sets the stakes, foreshadows the climax of the film, and actually happens on screen because it's exciting and dramatic. Just saying. Also, since we're here, we might as well talk about this pin as well. 
really don't see why we can't just go back to your apartment. That place is like a fortress. There's no way she could have gotten in there. She shouldn't have been able to get into the garage either. She already broke into your apartment once before. Now, this isn't a plot hole, it's a fairly inconsequential line, but it makes the writers look lazy, like they didn't really know their own story. You know, almost like they were just kind of writing each scene one by one really quickly without ever going back and doing a second draft to tighten the story up. Pin the third. Do you think you're the first woman he'd hoped would save him? Like its characters, the movie does a terrible job at defining its boundaries. The philosophical stance of the villain, Elena Lincoln, is that Christian is so damaged that he needs his BDSM lifestyle in order to be functional, but is incapable of happiness. There's a few problems here. Problem the first. While this is the stance of the villain, it's never actually repudiated by anyone or anything else. No one ever questions her basic premise, that Christian's BDSM thing is emergent from his trauma, they simply disprove her conclusion by having Anna fix Christian's problems. Problem the second. The movie does a really bad job at differentiating bondage and other kinky play, which typically has some element of power dynamic inherent in one partner being restrained and the other doing the restraining, from power dynamics of submission and domination. As a result, everyone is constantly talking about this thing that Christian needs. But you need all those things. He needs a submissive in life, but it's what he needs. Maybe you just really need someone who obeys every command. What's gonna happen when you start needing them again? But this happens without clearly defining how exactly this nebulous need is different from all the kinky stuff that they do get up to beyond the vague sense of more and total control. This is backing up to the previous film, but there's no clear sense of what a day in the life of being Christian sub would actually look like. Like, he says total submission, but that doesn't actually mean anything on its own. It's entirely subjective to the whims and tastes of the dominant. However, that's not to say that the question is unanswered. If you put in the legwork of digging out all the parts and filling in the blanks, the answer is that he wants a sex slave who doubles as a replacement mother. He selects subs who look like his dead mom, who he refers to throughout the books as the crack whore. The crack whore. My birth mother. Expects them to clean and cook, wants them to be sexually available at all times, and they just have to let him beat them really, really, really hard with a belt or cane. And that's actually about it. He just wants someone he can whip with a belt whenever he's angry or frustrated or horny, who otherwise does whatever banal thing springs into his head and generally mothers him when they're not in sex mode. That's not intense kink so much as it's the profile of a serial killer. And okay, like I said in the previous installment, this admission that Christian is actually really bad as a dominant, that he's actually a predator who uses the role of dominant to find submissives who almost universally peace out after they realize they've been conned into participating in his maternal revenge fantasy, that's not invalid as a dramatic idea but it's not admitted or even really acknowledged until the scene where Christian is like, that's who I was, but I'm fixed now, see, I'll let you touch my scars, and then functionally dropped. And this is because of problem the third. Erica Mitchell thinks that all power exchange is equally immoral, proposes that engaging in submission and domination relationships will damage you to the point that you can only be cured by true love, and doesn't differentiate between Christian's narcissistic oedipoidal psychopathy and other forms of power exchange. The two relevant scenes here are Anna's conversation with Hannah and the climactic encounter with Leela. In the first, we get the most philosophically coherent statement of the film, summed up, just go with the flow. The correct way to have a relationship is to just, like, figure it out, man. And the rest of it will just make up as we go. Which is not, you know, terrible advice. Like, as far as, far as advice goes, it's, it's fine. In the second, we get the supporting argument, being a submissive will melt your brain. Yeah. <sighs> I 
You can maybe understand why the BDSM kink community isn't exactly hot on this property. Pins 5 and 6, the complete non-argument argument about Book Expo. And uh, if you really want to go, then I can't stop you. But I'd like to take you there myself. Okay, so this is changed a bunch from the book, but it's still intensely frustrating because it's just so, so, so poorly written. The change for the better is that when Christian first tells Anna, no, you can't go, she responds with, I wasn't asking. All right, cool, conflict. But then the substance of the argument just gets bizarre. So he keeps telling her that if she wants to go to New York, he'll take her to New York because he wants to be there the first time she sees New York. If you want to go to New York, don't go with Hyde. Let me take you. I have a place there. And Anna points out that it's not seeing New York, it's a business trip. And yeah, being stuck in the Javits Center for a weekend isn't exactly seeing the sights. But Christian just keeps repeating his offer to take Anna to see New York. He just completely talks past her over and over until Anna just takes this as a valid response and drops the issue. All of this as a cumulative element of the movie makes Anna into a much more passive agent than she was under the previous writer and director. While Grey managed a nominal character arc of Anna learning to stand up for her boundaries. No. In this film, Anna manages at best some token resistance before caving and acquiescing to whatever Christian wants. And now you may be wondering, why is this glorious non-argument argument even here? Okay, so. In the book at this point, Christian knows that Jack Hyde is a rapist, but he's not telling Anna because he's trying to prove to her that he's better than her and that the world is too dangerous for her to be anything other than his sub. But... If we take out Christian's meddling entirely, then it's going to be completely insane when Jack turns into Mr. Hyde and tries to molest Anna in a couple days. And if we take that out, then the entire third movie is ruined. Baby, it's gonna take more than a malfunctioning 135. Pin number six, Mrs. Jones's introduction. Christian? <gasps> oh my god. Oh, excuse me, Miss Steele, I didn't mean to startle you. No, no, I, I, you are, you are very quiet. I'm Mrs. Jones, Mr. Gray's housekeeper. This is the kind of awful filmmaking that I'm here for. This bit fails on literally every level possible without adding wind tunnel noises and a live studio audience to the soundtrack. I'm Mrs. Jones, Mr. Gray's housekeeper. May I? Oh, um... <laughs> Mrs. Jones is Christian's housekeeper. She's a bit part introduced early in the books, but dropped from the first movie because she's a bit part that's completely irrelevant to the story. And for absolutely no discernible reason, 30 minutes into the second movie, she gets a full introduction and is introduced like a horror villain. Like, seriously, there's an unsettling length of time in this shot where the camera avoids showing her face. Why was this cut like this? Why is it shot like this in the first place? Why does any of this even happen? Okay, so not only has Anna been at Gray's apartment many, many times, often for days at a time over the past month, but Mrs. Jones has already been in this movie. She's mentioned in one scene and Gray talks to her over the phone in another. She turned up here and tried to slit her wrist in front of Mrs. Jones, my housekeeper. Mr. Gray, your appointment's arrived. Okay, send them into Anna's room. Her presence is already established. It is 100% okay if Anna walks in and goes, hey, Mrs. Jones, like they've already met off screen. It's a trivial relationship that is exactly as deep as it appears. Mrs. Jones is the housekeeper. End of story. But just to contextualize this creative decision, in the priority of things that the movie feels are important to show us, Leela showing up and trying to kill herself. She turned up here and tried to slit her wrist in front of Mrs. Jones, my housekeeper. Anna meeting the housekeeper for the first time. I'm Mrs. Jones, Mr. Gray's housekeeper. All right, while we're talking about bit characters, let's talk about pin eight. Champagne, Mr. Gray. Thanks, Gretchen. And can I just say happy birthday? This is Gretchen. 
Gretchen is a blonde, which in the logic of Fifty Shades means that she's a temptress and homewrecker. Gretchen shows up a couple times in the book to make moony eyes at Christian so that Anna can think to herself about how much she hates Gretchen and hates that other women think her hot boyfriend is hot. Gretchen serves no purpose since literally every other similar moment from the books up to this point has been dropped from the films, making this one moment, five minutes before the end of the movie, really, really weird. Also, can we just talk for a moment about how Christian, the reclusive, cold weirdo with no social skills, is constantly referred to as the most eligible bachelor in Seattle, when his brother Elliot is, one, better looking, two, also extremely rich, and three, a totally chill bro playboy serial dater who owns a construction company and a chain of surf shops? Okay, pin seven. I'm not a dominant. I'm not. I... The right term is a sadist. I get off on punishing women, women who look like you. Like your look... mother. So if you haven't caught on by now, this line is different from the way it appears in the book. And while part of me is disappointed because the crack whore, my birth mother, is such a transcendentally awful phrase that I was really looking forward to watching a human try to act it out, I'm not particularly surprised that it was changed. This change almost certainly came as a mandate from Universal. A reader for the studio had to go through the books and make a bunch of notes for necessary adaptational changes, and top of the page was, you cannot use the phrase, the crack whore, to refer to Christian's birth mother. It may feel like I've overused that clip, but it's deliberate. I can't really adequately explain just how repetitive and mean-spirited the books are, so this is the best way of communicating that essence. This line right here is the soul of the Fifty Shades books. I'm a sadist. I like to whip little brown-haired girls like you, because you all look like the crack whore, my birth mother. While we're on the subject, one of the horror movie aspects of this exchange that the books try to pass off as romantic is the extrapolated logic that Christian staffs his office exclusively with blondes, specifically because they don't remind him of his dead mom, and thus he won't want to punish them and or have sex with them. So the last big thing that I want to talk about for this installment is Jack. Let's talk about Jack. I wasn't entirely sure where to put this because it's important here in Darker, but it's only important here because it's critical in Freed. So I think I'll try to talk about it here and we'll see if this makes any sense at all. Jack Hyde is the primary antagonist of Fifty Shades Freed. He breaks into Gray's office to firebomb their servers it's backfilled that Christian's helicopter crash is due to Jack sabotaging the motor. He attempts to kidnap Anna at knife point, then kidnaps Christian's sister Mia and threatens to shoot her if Anna doesn't give him $5 million in ransom. All the other stuff that's set up and floating around unresolved at the end of Fifty Shades Darker stays that way. Jose getting this jealous close-up at the engagement announcement, he has, like, one line in the next film. Elena Lincoln, she's not even in the theatrical version of Freed. Leela, the stalker who attacked Anna with a gun, is mentioned once to assure the audience that she's accounted for and totally, definitely not involved at all in any way. But it raises the question, did they not read the third book before writing the second movie? Why didn't they fix problems they knew about? If you know that this character is going to become the central climactic villain of your entire series, why would you not put in a bit more legwork to actually build that up? Yes, the answer is that they're lazy hacks cashing an easy paycheck, but why would you basically advertise that fact? Shouldn't you at least try to hide it? They dropped the ball on this so badly that the first time I saw the film, I wasn't really sure who this was. I originally read Freed very quickly in a haze back in 2013 and had largely forgotten pretty much the entire book aside from the inexplicable subplot where Anna's stepdad gets into a car accident that occupies a good chunk of the back half of the book. So the fact that Jack Hyde was in fact going to be the main antagonist wasn't at the forefront of my brain and sitting through the movie had sapped whatever cognitive capacity was left. So the movie finally gets to the end and there's this sinister character in the dark looking all beat up and it's a dude who disappeared from the movie almost entirely an hour earlier and I honestly said to myself, wait, who is that? 
I know I said earlier that it was a good choice to swap the Jack and Leela confrontations, but it's yet another good microcosm of the Catch-22 that is adapting these books. The confrontation with Leela is the more dramatic one. Leela is in the middle of a complete meltdown and she has a gun. The stakes are higher, the jeopardy is higher, and the confrontation itself ties into the relationship between Grey and Anna in a more coherent and direct manner. Of the two attacks, it is the appropriate climax of this movie but it's not important to the series as a whole. It's almost worse that they actually did add in a bunch of changes to try and draw explicit parallels between Christian and Jack. Like, Jack is supposed to be the evil version of Christian, which fails as a parallel because Christian is already the evil version of Christian, and that they inserted him at the ball taking the photo of Christian's family because it shows some level of awareness of the problem, but then addressed in the laziest, lowest effort manner possible. The fact that Christian's helicopter was sabotaged by Jack is still going to come up in the next movie, but nothing was added to this one to make that any more plausible as a plot point. In fact, this movie actually does less than the books to suggest that it was foul play. Baby, it's gonna take more than a malfunctioning 135 to keep me away from you. Charlie Tango, she's a Eurocopter EC-135, the safest in its class. And for our purposes, that's going to be our bridge to Fifty Shades Freed. Join me next time for a grotesque, overly long video that's basically one giant third act devoid of its own internal structure, just like the book that it's based on.